So this is also the story about why. Searching for the big question, why? Why did this happen? And really that question of why is what any fictional story hangs on. Not so much the what, but the why. Why did this character do that? Why are we going in this direction and not that direction? So this is the story of a really giant why. Here's just a cover photo of my uh, book. On the left, it's available at, Am at Amazon. It's also available at my website called Halverson New Media. It's cheaper at my website, but you can get it at Amazon. I also have a coordinating workbook that goes with this presentation. It's all about encouraging uh, those of you who might be intimidated about writing stories to begin to do so. And it's full of writing exercises um, that are meant to get you going. I also have, if you're at all interested in running a book group featuring inmates, I have a book discussion guide and you can email me about book groups and discussion guides. How about that? So I'm just going to present to you this question and keep those pens poised as we go along. Is there a big why? in your family, a big why to your family's history. Why did, hmm, think about that as I proceed, okay? As I proceed, I hope that you will write out that why or that secret you have in your family or that big question you have or the mystery. Everybody's got one, I'm almost guaranteed. So think about that, scribble it down now or as it comes to you as I speak. I used to teach college. I'm used to being ignored. Don't worry about that. Write it down now, and as I'm talking, um, we'll discuss it further in a little bit, okay? So I want to just back up just a little bit. So I am not a genealogist. In fact, wanting to do genealogy research was the last thing on my list. This was my view of genealogical research in the past, 15 years ago. I kind of thought of it as that extremely boring teacher you had in seventh or eighth grade in history class. The War of 1812 began on August 7th and 1700 troops were killed and then we moved on to October 8th. Uh, boring, I'm sorry, not my cup of tea. So I'm a little intimidated speaking to a group of gene genealogists out there, okay? But it was really not my thing. And if you had told me you are going to take this on as a hobby and a project, I would have said seriously, no, 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 don't want to sounds horrible to me. And then something happened. But uh, my husband is from New England. I'm originally from Minnesota and you will see all sorts of references to that. Shout out to Wisconsin out there in our studio audience. Um, my husband was researching his family all the way back to the Mayflower as most New Englanders can do. That Mayflower must have been the size of a modern day cruise ship. Am I wrong? Anyway, uh, he was doing the research and he got to a certain point where he said, I've got the answers and then the puzzle just grows from all sides. So he called it the never ending crossword puzzle is what family research is about. And I kind of saw that. I had no interest in what he was doing, no interest in my own family, frankly. I had an interest, however, in the technology behind all of this. The fact that all of those documents federal, state, and local, and private sources were interconnected and all over the world, and we could find them using specific websites like Ancestry.com. That just fascinated me. I'm kind of a web geek. I'm kind of a tech geek, and just wanted to see how did this work way back when I had never touched um, Ancestry.com at all. So I went there. I wanted to try it, and I'm going to show you what I did in a minute, but if you can take a moment to call up your chat box and type in to the chat box, which of these apply to you? Have you done your own research already? And give me a clue as to what stage you're at. Are you stumped, or as the genealogists call it, a brick wall? Have you hit a brick wall in your research? Apparently that happens a lot, and this is the story of one of those brick walls. And finally, type in the chat box if you can, have you inherited somebody else's research in your family? They've handed you, they've died, and you've got the boxes. Uh, you discovered the boxes in the, the cellar, in the attic. Um, did somebody hand you to, hand this stuff to you and say, here, do something with this, and you're going, what? I don't want to do that. If you can find the chat box by rolling over the toolbar where your face is um, and finding it and then just typing right in. Three brick walls. Oh, my goodness. 
no inheritance. Um, Barbara, I love that. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes, yes, and no. Um, that's fabulous. Thank you. Keep those answers coming. Um, it appears that this happens a lot, that people will inherit the boxes and the file folders, and they too have no interest. So I had a woman in my presentation the other night on Zoom, and she said she had inherited not documents, but a whole lot of photographs. And she opened it up and went, who are all these people? And that got her on the path of doing the genealogical research. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that I've narrowed my stuff down to these five, six box, five boxes. <laughs> and that's after years of trying. But um, who are all these people is a pretty common response. Photos, don't know who they are. Yep, I have done some. We've got several brick walls, several brick walls. Inherited someone else's research. Uh, yep, all over the map. Um, I have a brick wall. The Atlantic Ocean is a brick wall. I love that. And I have the photos. Um, so because it sounds like you're all in the same boat, I want to present this question, put this question before you. What is your end game? I have news for you. Someday you're going to leave this earth. What are you going to do with all that stuff? Will you pass it on? Will somebody find it in your cellar? Uh, are you going to keep it in those file folders or boxes? Are you going to attempt to make sense of it somehow? And maybe you'll dabble in writing biographical sketches of all those people, or maybe a timeline of your family's history. This is what happened. Or maybe a, a family tree. But what is it? If any of you have begun to write something, I'd love to hear about it and type that into the chat box if you could. I hear this um, ha happening a lot. People will say, well, I'm going to put it into some form and I'm going to produce it in some way. Uh, maybe one of those, um, you know, uh, self-publishing things, they can print just enough for the family or type out something um, and distribute it at the next Thanksgiving dinner. So tell me what your end game is if you have one. And if you don't, um, think about making a plan for your stuff. And if you are genealogists and members of the club there, I'm sure you've thought about this. So um, my point overall is every family, every family is riddled, simply riddled with interesting stories and interesting characters. And it's time to get them out into the open, to put them on stage and to put them out to the public beyond your family. That's my opinion. Um, passing it on to my niece who's showing an interest in creating a book, writing biographical poetry. Oh, that is fun. Judith, I want to hear more about that later. That's very fun. Create a narrative record for family as a gift. That's a typical response, all right? So as I go forward and as you continue with your research, consider that outside of your family, people might care. If you can shape the story um, in, a, in a good storytelling way. So um, if you are doing genealogy, you probably realize you have to, if you are going to do any of those things, make a family tree, write biographical sketches, give something to the family. You have to stick a stake in the stand, sand somewhere, somewhere and begin, right? Because history going backwards doesn't end. There is no end to it. It is that never-ending crossword puzzle. So where are you going to stick a stake in the sand? Tell the story of a certain era or a certain family only in all of the families or a certain character in all of the families. Think about that um, as we go forward. What are you going to write? So here I am about to tell you how we got here. First off, I am not a professional genealogist, and this is good, going to become clear to you all. This is the response of actual genealogists to my methods. You, she, you did what, huh? Um, and understand that I went at this backwards and upside down and uh, sideways before I realized I, I really should have been doing this properly until I got to a certain point when I knew I needed to have good records. Anyway. This is where it all began. Where it all began. I wanted to figure out the technology to see how it worked. And you probably know this, that Ancestry.com and the U.S. Census data stored there can be the cornerstone of everything. The U.S. Census done every 10 years is just so, so important. We're in the middle of that now, right? Um, but every 10 years, at least, you can know things about your family, going back to the beginning of the census in this country. So I gave myself the assignment um, to find out where that maternal grandmother of mine, the woman I spent Thanksgiving and Christmas with until I was 23, um, where was she before my mother, her daughter, was born? 
That was the assignment I said, just so I could try out the technology. So my mother was born in 1926. So census wise, I said, I'm gonna find out where she was, my maternal grandmother, where she was before my mother was born. So that would put her in 1920. So where was she in 1920? And as you may know, Ancestry.com gives this advice to begin with. You start with the known knowns. You start with what you do know, what you could prove independently before you go down the path of genealogical research. So I had this in the effects from my grandmother um, as my mother inherited them from her. My mother is long gone. She was long gone by the time I undertook this as well. <coughs> but um, she is uh, my grandmother, maternal grandmother's name is Ethelyn Thompson. So here's her birth certificate. This was in the documents. Ethelyn Thompson, right? That's what I know her as. Born July 4th, 1902, right? Check. Um, and I knew about Christina, her mother, because guess what? That's who I'm named for, Christine. Um, I never really knew her father's name, but here it is on the birth certificate. T-O-H-S, uh, um, an abbreviation for Thomas. So there's Thomas H. Thompson and Christina Christensen, my great grandparents, as evidenced on this birth certificate I had, a known known. So going back to my assignment to try to find where was she in 1920, I pretty quickly find the right family, Christine Thompson. There's my great grandmother. There's no doubt about that because this is in the town of Minneapolis where all these people should have been at this point. Um, and furthermore, I can check and go, yep, Violet, one of her children, Christine, Violet, Arnold, and Everett, those are aunts and uncles to me. Not only do I know their names, I actually met them when I, when I was very young, um, maybe met them once, once, but nevertheless knew the names, Violet, Arnold, and Everett. So yep, that's got to be the right family. And then I see that Christina, paternal great-grandmother, is listed as head of household. Huh? And furthermore, my grandmother, the Ethelyn in question, is not here. She's not in this document, and she would have been 17 or 16 at the time this census was taken in 1920. So where is she? Where is she? And furthermore, where is uh, my great-grandfather, that Thomas, T-O-H-S, Thomas? Where's my great-grandfather at this point in 1920? Hmm, don't know. So right here, I'm sort of hooked, right? And I say, hmm, maybe if I go back a decade in the census, go back by 10 years to 1910, something will become clear to me. So I do that and pretty quickly find the right family. And here I have a Thomas in 1910, Thomas Thompson and Christina Thompson, my great grandmother. And there's Bernita and Pearl and Ethelyn and Violet. Violet, you saw on the previous screen, she was the younger sibling to Ethelyn. And Bernita and Pearl are older siblings to Ethelyn, people that I would have known in real life, knew their names, met them, absolutely, okay? This is the right family living a little south of Minneapolis, nothing unusual about that. But Ethelyn, my grandmother, her name is spelled incorrectly, something this woman had to put up with all of her life. She was Ethelyn, and she was often uh, called in this document, Ethelyn with an I, and that gives me a clue. So um, stopping there to say, Count yourself lucky if you have a family full of unusual names, okay? So this is Minnesota, which is full of Scandinavians. All of their last names are Johnson and Halverson and Swanson and Peterson and uh, all of those. Um, but their first names are also very repetitive, not as unusual as you see here. Bernita, Pearl, Everett, Violet, Ethelyn, I don't know any of those to be a Scandinavian name, but those were all of her siblings. And this combination of Bernita and Pearl, two people I knew in real life with these weird names, the top one was called Bernie, um, that saved me on more than one occasion in my research, right? You all must understand how good that is, how appropriate that was. Anyway, many, many, many searches later, I come upon 1920, back to 1920, I come upon what I presume to be the correct Ethelyn Thompson. She is listed at a place called the Hennepin County Homeschool for Girls in Minneapolis. Hennepin County Homeschool for Girls. I had no clue when I saw this. She's listed here with a bunch of other young girls between the ages of 10 and 17. 
She is 17 years old. Um, you can't see this very well, but she is there amongst other people, none of whom are Scandinavian last names, which would be unusual in Minneapolis at this moment. But she is listed as an inmate at this institution called the Hennepin County Home School for Girls. And without realizing it, I had what became the future title of the book that I wrote, Inmate. She was an inmate in some type of institution. I don't know anything about the institution at this moment, and I absolutely, positively don't know why she's there. So right there, I'm hooked. I am now a genealogist. Well, I'm a researcher. Well, I'm trying. Anyway, I'm trying to answer the question of the big why. So I'm thinking maybe if I find her older siblings somewhere in that 1920, um, if I find them out in the world, maybe that'll be a clue. The siblings I knew about anyway. Um, I do find them together. Hooray, Bernita and Pearl are together in a tiny town north of Minneapolis at the same, in that same year, 1920. They are together and one's a servant and one's a rumor, as in a uh, renting from somebody at this boarding house. But it doesn't help me figure out why my, my grandmother is at a place called the Hennepin County Home School for Girls. So I'm thinking, uh, don't have any answers there, maybe evidence of the parents' deaths, Christina and Thomas's deaths. Maybe that will shed some light on this question of what my grandmother did in the Hennepin County Home School for Girls. And maybe I could find their death certificate. So you all know, I don't have to tell you what a treasure trove an actual printed out death certificate might be in trying to solve some family mysteries. So I went um, searching for those death, uh, death certificates of my great grandparents, Christina and Thomas, and news flash here, my grandparents never died. They, great grandparents, they never died. Here they are still alive somewhere in the world at age 159 and 146. Okay, I'm lying, I don't have any photographs of these people, but I cannot find evidence of their death. I cannot, I have tried or maybe on the Christina, book two, okay? But anyway, I was hitting a brick wall for sure. And furthermore, in Minneapolis, this, there couldn't be worse names to try to find. Thomas Thompson and Christina Christensen can be misspelled in uh, uh, an endless number of ways. And they were, and they are. Um, could not find evidence of their death. I needed to move beyond Ancestry.com at this point, that's for sure. I began writing letters and I had my mother's address books, which contained last known addresses for my now very elderly um, great aunts and uncles, but they would have been long past as well by the time I began this research. But I wrote to the addresses I had, got no responses, nobody's still living there. And then guess what? It was the Minneapolis Public Library that pointed me in the right direction. God bless the libraries of America. They are so awesome. This is a giant place in downtown Minneapolis. And I went there in person, maybe 15 years ago, with the quest of finding out what the heck is the Hennepin County Home School for Girls. And without much ado, I came across this um, report to the Board of Directors, the annual report. And right there we can see hmm, the juvenile court. The Hennepin County Home School for Girls was somehow related to the juvenile court system of Hennepin County. And this document, it was about 10 pages long, just a report to the board and was full of helpful information. It wasn't the years I needed, but I absolutely came to understand what that entity was all about. All right, it wasn't the right years, but here's what I learned. I learned that if you were a member, an inmate in the Hennepin County Home School for Girls, you were possibly abused, neglected, orphaned. Nope, her mother is alive in 1920, so she's not truly an orphan. You might be truant from school. You might be delinquent. You might be incorrigible. I love that one. We'll talk more about that. Or you might be an unwed mother. So going on, this, this would have been uh, 1917 about, if you took it back a couple of years from 1920, the ways you could be delinquent in 1917 are begging on the street, selling any articles or singing or playing any musical instrument on the street, I love that, um, or giving a public entertainment, that might be a euphemism for something else, uh, or you are incorrigible. And here are all the ways you could be incorrigible in 1917. 
You could be associated with thieves, vicious or immoral, immoral persons. You could be a runaway. You could be growing up idle. Oh, glad I wasn't around then. You could be patronizing places where gaming devices were operated. This is 1917 in Minneapolis. You may or may not know that Minneapolis was a hotbed of gang activity up until Prohibition and through Prohibition. Um, lots of gang activity because of the Mississippi River going right through that town. Anyway, patronizing places where gaming devices were operated, patronizing a public pool hall with a capital P that stands for T, right? Uh, or wandering the street at night or wandering the railroad yards or tracks or jumping onto moving trains. Those are all the ways you could be incorrigible according to that document I found at the library and what could get you a uh, sentence to live at a place called the Hennepin County Home School for Girls using bad language was in there too and being an unwed mother. I began from this point on to assume being an unwed mother was probably the most likely scenario for my great-grandmother for my grandmother and that's why it wasn't talked about at all um, but uh, I was in no way certain uh, it was still just searching for the big why. Why was she there? What caused that family to be broken up? I wrote a letter to the existing Hennepin H County Homeschool for Girls. That entity still existed up until last fall, fall of 19, uh, 2019. They were still um, in Minneapolis. I went to visit the site of it once, um, but they just closed just last fall. They, the mission changed over the years, but they were what we would call a group foster home now. Um, and finally, I paid a professional archivist at the Minnesota Historical Society to do the research for me. I said, I can't do this. And here I am in New Hampshire. It's very difficult to figure out where to go from here. I was willing to pay a professional at the Minnesota Historical Society. And very rapidly, she came back, returned my check and said, can't help you. It's not that we can't find the records of why she was sentenced to live at the Hennepin County Home School for Girls, but that no records were kept. No records were kept of why she was in that home. So that is a brick wall if ever, <laughs> if ever I saw one. It was a dead end. I could have been just discouraged and despondent of spending all that time and not being able to get at the answer and furthermore not ever being able to get at the answer. Every buddy related to that family is long gone. It was a small family to begin with and they would all have been passed at this point. All right, so a dead end, but I took it as a challenge. I gave myself permission to lie. That's what fiction writers do. They just lie. They just make it up. So I gave myself to make a permission to make it up and I had lots and lots of facts to go on, historical facts. And so that's what makes this book called Inmate, really inspired by true and alternative facts in my family. So at this point, since I decided to write a his work of historical fiction, I had to do some historical research rather than genealogical research. Um, and this would be the response of actual historians to my research method as well. Um, when at it backwards, sideways, ups and, ups and downs, I've always had an interest in history, uh, but not anything formal training me how to do it. So um, here were the known knowns as I undertook at that point was she was court ordered to be there in 1920. People spent two to three years there on average. Hmm, you could back that up a couple years to the year 1918. Furthermore, and furthermore, if I can't find my great grandfather, her father, if um, my great grandmother, her mother, is working as a laundress and living with three remaining young children in the home, but my grandmother, age 17, is not among them, hmm. but she is at a home that has something to do with abuse, neglect, orphan, delinquent, unwed mothers, hmm, 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 1918. Does anybody want to put in the chat box what they think was significant about 1918? Or if we have the capabilities of raising our hand, <laughs> Monica wins the prize on World War I, and Portsmouth Library says Spanish flu. Absolutely. Flu epidemic Martha and Crystal got it on the flu. Absolutely. Those two extremely significant historical facts were happening in 1918. It was either the end of the war, 
which was in the fall of that year or the beginning of the flu pandemic, which happened in the fall of that year, went away, came back in the spring. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Anyway, for the record, I was writing all about this pandemic before we were in the midst of another one. So those were the two giant historical features I knew had to play some role in the book I was about to write. They were my sticks in the sand. Somehow I could tie these two concepts together in the book and I could not write a book without mentioning them. And so the hard work of writing that book began. If you will indulge me, um, we're going to click through on this video here in which I am reading the first chapter of the book that I wrote called Inmate. And we're going to hope this works and I'm going to hope Nicole is out there to, to monitor whether it's working correctly. Doo -doo. Tylene, will you tell me that this is working? No, I just got the, I got a Facebook author screen. Really made up okay. There, no. Stand by. Did your screen change? Yes, it changed to you. <laughs> there we go. Now it has. Okay. Now we'll be quiet and this should work. Okay, there, there it's working. Little repeat. We can't hear it. Can you turn it up? Yes. Well, I think I can. Let's see if we can uh, get that volume up a little bit. I'm not sure if I have control over that or... Folks, in the if you could type in the chat box whether it's loud enough for you. Not quite loud enough. Um, and I don't see a volume on my end. Yeah, I don't either. Hmm. All right, maybe we'll skip that in order to save time. Hmm. Let, let, let me let it, let it run a second and tell me if it's... And so this is a story of what happened to Ethel, That's better. great grandmother, during that Spanish flu epidemic. What do you think, folks? I'd like to read you the first chapter. Is it loud enough? No, not no. really. Okay, we're going to skip that then in, in order to save time. I'll go back to the presentation. Tell me that the screen came back to Facebook author page. Yes. Excellent. Folks, um, I will include this link in the many links I'm going to send to Nicole, who could send them out to you. Well um, done. Yeah. And if you click through, you should be able to hear me um, read the first chapter, and then I talk about it a little bit at the end. So let me just review what I would say at the end. The end that I said, um, back in April, is fear not, this story has a happy ending. Now, writers are not supposed to give that away, but here we are in the midst of pandemic, a horrible pandemic and people dying. I didn't want you to despair as you heard the first chapter. Um, so if that would um, prevent you from reading that book at this point, um, know that it turns out all right, okay? So, um, We've got some five messages here in the chat box. Yeah, I can't, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let me know it wasn't being able to be heard. So um, if you're at all interested in that topic, and perhaps you've seen these books mentioned over the last six months because they do keep coming up in the news now, but um, I knew nothing when I undertook this 15 years ago. I knew nothing about the Spanish flu, except it seemed to be in the general consciousness. Uh, when I saw that the, the year 1918, I went, well, that's when the flu happened. Um, and it was significant in Minnesota as it was all over the country and all over the world. Um, but what, how I retaught myself about it was the book on the left, The Great Influenza, is a great book by a great historian, John Barry. The one in the middle, The America's Forgotten Pandemic, is a nice little short um, book, shorter book about the pandemic by Alfred Crosby, another noted historian. And on the right, the one on the right um, was published when I was in the midst of doing this research. And she is Gina Col Colada, I believe is how you pronounce that. She's a New York Times columnist still, and she's been writing a lot about the pandemic. Um, but between those two books, my point is, uh, in, that, in the giant black tome on the left, they had not figured out really why it killed so many people so quickly. Uh, and what I mean by that is, 
otherwise extremely healthy young men were uh, well in the morning and by nightfall they were dead. That's the way this book opens up. And they never really could figure out why, what was the biology behind that. And in the intervening years, this book on the right, Flu, explains how they finally figured out what the mechanism was for these very rapid deaths in the Spanish flu. So I highly recommend all these books and especially the ones on either side. All right, so um, earlier I said to you all, you've all got your own secrets, your own mysteries, your own why. In, uh, uh, Monica has read that book. Why in your family or a secret in your family? Um, and I want to, at this point, um, encourage you all to think one step further from your one secret or your big question or your big why and write out literally take your pen and paper at this moment if you can and write out um, a description of some leading character that plays into that question of why in your family or the mystery in your family the secret in your family Pick one of the key players and write down everything you do know about that person. And then write down everything you do know about the question that you're trying to answer, the why or the, the secret or the mystery. Um, and do that as I continue to speak. Compelling writing should include original detail. So if you can just scribble things out, like Uncle Tom had red hair and he always came to Thanksgiving smelling of cigars and he was always late and he always had a great excuse, or something like that. Um, whatever, however it relates to your mystery, write out a few sentences relating to the characters. Whatever comes to mind, don't think too hard on this. And then when you get to a point where, I don't remember anymore, fill in the blanks of your memory with anything that might pop into your mind. In other words, give yourself permission not to be accurate, but there's just to write down what comes into your mind, what connection your brain is making as you're doing this writing. And turn that into a, a quick paragraph that you can write um, touching all of those topics, a mystery in your family, some of the characteristics of a key player, and then write for five minutes, or write as I continue speaking here, without stopping to think, um, keeping the pen moving across the page. And now I want to put this in front of you. Um, we don't have time to go through all of you writing something and, and discussing it today, but if any one of you is ready to um, share it with me, share it with the group by the end of this presentation in the chat box. We'll do that at the end. Or if you'd rather wait until sent later in the week, send it to me um, using that email address. I would love to have you do that. And if you do any of those things, I will send you a copy of the workbook that I have. There's my email address. I put it in the chat box again. So in other words, you'll be rewarded if you write out your paragraph and send it to me one way or the other. And if you uh, want to read it at the end, we'll, we'll make time for one person to read their paragraph at the end of this. So um, this, um, that assignment I just gave you is based on a full-length workbook that I've done. It's five uh, writing sessions, five um, practice sessions that contain 14 different exercises for you, for you all to um, undertake if you um, happen to be a sort where you've got those file folders, you have wonderful research in your um, boxes and, and saved on your hard drive and you don't know what to do with it because you're intimidated at the writing process. That's what it's really meant for. Or if you your writing aren't really undertaking the genealogical research very well, um, the workbook is meant to encourage you. And you can find that at my website, Halverson New Media, and it's available for download. Um, but like I say, if you send me your uh, example, I will send you the thing for free. How's that? Um, so it's meant for genealogical enthusiasts and it's meant for beginner writers, whatever you are in there. So on the left there is just one, one tip out of many in the book. Um, it's five sessions and it contains four practice assignments, as I said. Uh, I walk you through how to go about finding the facts and then how to just uh, get down to it and write and then some ways to fuel your creativity. All right. So um, I also have a Facebook group that I would like you all to, I invite you all to join. It's uh, named for this presentation as well, Spinning Gold, Writing Compelling Stories from Family Research. So that Facebook group is meant for you 
to begin to chat about your process, whether the genealogical end of it or the writing end of it, with other people who are just like you, who have been in my presentations back a year, a year and a half. And so they come to the group and they talk to each other, tips and tricks, and I throw my tips and tricks in there as well. It's just fun, we have fun, no pressure, um, but I bet you'll learn some things if you join the group. So you can go to Facebook and do a search for that title that you see there, Spinning Gold, Writing Compelling Stories from Family Research. And I can include uh, a link, a direct link to that in the document that I'll send to Nicole to have her send out, okay? And if you join that group, you might be able to find out which of the people in that picture of women playing baseball, which one is my grandmother. All right, so a few more words about the writing process. And then I do wanna shut up and give you all a chance to tell me your stories. And I believe you were invited to have at hand um, artifacts or something from your family. And if you have such a thing, I'd love to see it. Um, and I think we're gonna go through a process of having you raise your hand and then we'll look and we'll talk and we'll chat and see how long that goes, okay? So um, just a few more words about the writing process and then we'll get into that part of it. Other tricks you can adopt to jumpstart your writing if you're hesitant. Just a few things that I've learned along the way. Highly, highly recommend this writing book called Writing Down the Bones. It's a funny title for a method that is just meant to get you writing. To uh, set aside your internal editor, we all have that internal editor, that English teacher who said, make sure you use the serial comma or don't, or make sure each paragraph has five sentences and the first one must be a topic sentence, the last one must be a concluding sentence. Anyway, to get over the rules of writing early in the process, in order to just get to the process of writing. That's what this book is all about. Many of you maybe know it. Please type in the chat box if you've heard of it before. Um, I was lucky enough to be a student of Natalie Goldberg, the author of this book, um, in 1987, before she became a big deal, but this book was hot off the press at that point. Um, her writing method changed my life. Again, I told you I was trained as a journalist, um, and that means I had to tell the facts in a certain order, um, I could write a competent sentence, but I couldn't write a creative sentence until taking her class. All right, so some other things you can do if you're stuck or fearful about the writing process is uh, if you're freezing in the writing, it means you are trying too hard to control the information. And that was kind of the point of my original assignment to get you over that freezing and trying so hard, just do it slap it on the paper. It may not make any sense to anybody but you. It might be nonsensical, um, but just to do it and to give yourself permission to practice and practice in that way. Yay, the library has Writing Down the Bones. Fabulous. Go check it out. I highly recommend that book, and I highly recommend you do the exercises in that book. So here are some other writing type tips to look with your memory, with the resources of your experience. That's what uh, a tip that comes from a fabulous book called Technique in Fiction. And all that means is take a look at things differently. Use your experience in the world as you observe things as you go on. So here is that photograph you've seen as I've gone along. This is, in fact, my grandmother's baseball team when she was young. And this is a photograph that hung in her bedroom all of the years that I knew her until I was 23. Um, and it was, I was kind of fascinated by it because I too played baseball, but that was about as far as the fascination went when I was my own narcissistic teenager, right? So having inherited this photograph, it now hangs on my wall, or it's behind me actually. Um, I began, when I began this process of figuring out why was she at the Hennepin County Home School for Girls, I, had, I pulled this picture out and I went, oh cool, there's that fun baseball one. And then I went, hold on. As an adult, this is in Minneapolis, as an adult, I absolutely know where this photograph was taken. It's not marked in any way. Uh, there was no way to know it, but I know it because I know, as an adult, I know that town, Minneapolis, much better, of course, than I did when I was 14. Um, it's my hometown, other than having moved here 23 years ago. Um, but I knew literally where this picture was taken. I could walk there today if I was in Minneapolis. And furthermore, I'm looking around going, Hmm, that banner, Kickernick, that's a, that's a person's name. Um, and if it's anything like 
it would be today, it would be like, that's the sponsor of the team. And so I w looked up Kickernick in various historical documents in the Minneapolis library and came across, yep, it's a company name, Kickernick. I could find the building, the Kickernick building in downtown Minneapolis. And it turns out it was a place that I went to drink when I was in college. It was a bar, a very popular bar in that building. Um, but looking at, uh, sorry, looking at that photograph further, this is, I don't know what year it is, it's not marked, but looking at the fashions as an adult, I'm able to say, hmm, I'm thinking late 1910s. And um, in this case, it was, how can I say this, an episode of Downton Abbey that sort of clued me in here. Downton Abbey, one of my favorites, if not yours. Um, had an episode that featured special um, episode at the end of special about the wardrobe and the wardrobe guy was saying yep in 1918 it was all about the sailor type outfit because it was military militaristic um, and so women kind of war adopted that fashion and the fashion years of the day um, had that sailor type look and that he absolutely said it was around 1918 1920 and I went okay, that sort of pins the date on this photograph I have of my grandmother somewhere in here, uh, wearing that militaristic baseball uniform and a Kickernick um, sponsored team. Isn't that fun? But that's what I want to encourage you all to do. Pull out those photographs you've just become complacent about that have just become too commonplace for you and look at them with different eyes. Oh, sorry, Don, sorry, I hope everything is all right. So you feel free to go. Um, so that's what I mean by look with the, um, whatever that quote was, look with your memory. So here's another, I did pull out all the photographs I owned. I inherited everything from my mother that related to her mother, my grandmother. So I looked at these wonderful photographs and of course, as a person, I'm looking at the cute picture of me when I was two or three, this must be 1962 or something like that, sitting in my grandfather's lap. So her husband, my grandmother, Ethelin's husband, here he is there. And I look at that and go, okay, I'm not, I'm not looking at me. I'm not looking at my grandma, grandfather. I look at all the things around them, the rug, the table, the vase, the lamp, and say, those are kind of mm, high or higher class items than what I know about their income. So they were not rich people. They were probably lower middle class or upper lower class. My grandfather was a sheet metal worker and nobody else worked. So that just gives me, uh, I began for a long time to write the book about where did enough money to buy high-end furnishings come from? Uh, maybe there's a secret there. I kind of abandoned that line of questioning, but inspired by photos like this. So that's what I want you to do, your photographs. Monica has the same round mirror. So that was 1960s. Um, it's very 60s, isn't it, I think? Um, so um, I want to give you permission, if you are not comfortable with writing, but you're comfortable with doing the research, to just begin. That is the whole point. And to give yourself permission to have those false starts like I did. I did a whole uh, draft of the book in first person, and then an editor said it really should be, I mean, the other way around. I did it in third person, and an editor said it really should be in first person. That would be better. Um, uh, to give yourself the permission to start one way and and change it around to go down one path, chase down rabbit holes, and then redo it when you um, learn the truth, as it were. So right now, as I proceed, I continue to do an awful lot of genealogical research, but I'm doing it on a parallel track to making up the lies. So I'm building a story based on what I'm finding on the genealogical track and um, determining, trying to, trying to weave a story together for the next book. Um, but I'm doing them now simultaneously, as opposed to the first book. It was one and then the other, a very different process. So a uh, sneak preview of book two, it will take place in this graveyard, which is in the center of Minneapolis. I love, uh, was it um, Nicole at the library telling us about the graveyard girls? I want to go listen to them. What a great uh, uh, topic for a future presentation, the graveyard girls. So, um, does anybody out there have, I, I think we could open the mics and or um, ask people to raise their hands now, Nicole. Um, does anybody want to share 
the little bit of writing that I asked you to do, the mystery in your family or the uh, description of people that asked you to write? Anybody? I have no. unmuted everybody, but I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. No. Uh, I have never known where the raise of the hand feature is, but um, if your mic is open, if you have a question, feel free to shout it out. As long as you don't have crying kids or dogs in the background, we should be okay. Um, we'd love to just chat it up with you a little bit. Tell me the stories that you're working on and what your brick walls have been. Crystal, do you mean that to say you'll share your writing? Yes. Excellent. Do you want to read it out loud for the group? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boo -doo. All right. My great-grandmother, Adeline Nimo, was a bootlegger during Prohibition. She made her own bathtub gin. She was born in a small town in Italy and in Italy, oh, and in, now lived in a small town in Pennsylvania in a little Italy section. She employed most of her siblings and in-laws, and she was arrested several times. Whoa. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Crystal, can I ask you if you have written this before, or did you just No, write? just now. Okay. And you knew those things because of research you've done? Yes. All right. So I, I, how do you feel about writing in general, you as a writer? I'm usually afraid to try. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> okay, what you need to know, and maybe we'll ask some other folks who have their microphones open. What do you remember from what Crystal read? What stands out? Anybody? Bootlegger, Monica wrote, absolutely. That's yes. the word I wrote down. Bootlegger, everybody. Okay, bootlegger. I, you, I don't need to know anything else at this point. You've hooked me into a story. <laughs> family business. Bootlegging was the family business. Is that what you meant, Bobby? Yes. Uh, yes. And um, Crystal, did you say something like she was arrested several times? Yes. Yeah. You have a story there that needs to be written. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you, you know, I mentioned original detail is what makes writing interesting and you already gave me two pieces of original detail arrested and um, bootlegging those are the good kernels of a story that's going to interest other people absolutely so uh crystal if you will type in your email address to the checks or just to me in the chat box or afterwards whatever works for you i will send you the copy of the workbook okay for sharing thank that thank you anybody else want to share Anybody else want to share their little writing that we did right now? Quiet. You're quiet out there. <laughs> who's, all right. Who's got a brick wall that they have hit in their this research? This is Barbara. Can you hear oh, me? Yep. I can hear you, Barbara. Okay. Um, I'll share. Um, my why is why did they come? Uh, um, they came... I, no, let me rephrase that. John Nickshire was a tailor in Hungary. And when he came to the States in Pennsylvania, he was also a tailor. He came first, appears to have come alone, much earlier than the others. He came in like 1908, as I recall. And then um, his wife, and my grandmother came in 1922. Mm, oh, that's a big gap. Exactly. You know, did he travel back and forth? I've yet to discover. He also had a daughter, Teresa, from what I assume was another relationship, maybe marriage, who was much older than my grandmother. Yeah. So a lot of mystery there, and the elders that are still alive, including my 91-year-old mother, know nothing. They cannot answer my questions. <laughs> oh, you think that's real, or are they lying? 
I, they, I don't think they'd have any reason to lie. Yeah, so they did probably my mother, my mother has told me her greatest regret is she never asked her mother. Exactly, uh, yeah. What it was like coming over when she was 22, 23 years old and not, you know, wasn't able to speak a word of English. Yep. And did you say they came from Hungary? They well, that's the other interesting thing. My great grandfather s said he came from a town in Hungary, but my grandmother's paperwork said she came from the same town, but it was Austria. And of course, that Hungarian Austrian um, Empire border yes. change often. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Came from the same. And uh, and I am now wondering if maybe they had a little Jewish in them, oh. and maybe that's why they left. Sure. That they would be... were raised. You know, my mother was raised Catholic, but who knows? Yep. Uh but yeah. Again, not not a professional historian or genealogist, but um. That was a time when the Jewish population of that part of the world was migrating. It had to be secretive. You know? they, yeah, it had to be secretive. And that, that going back and forth stuff, I mean, uh, somebody coming here and then waiting to send for people yes. as well. Very, very common. Very, very common. And um, well, Monica's typing, may have left for food, may have left to avoid military service. There was a lot of that. Le Thank you, Monica. Leaving for military service. Um, and coming here and getting their fortune and then uh, being able to send for people when they had enough money. Um, but that, uh, not to cast dispersions on your family, but um, when I was doing these workshops live in person in the time before the virus, I, I, you'd be, I'm, I'm astonished at the number of people come to my workshops and say, well, dad had a complete, uh, completely other family we didn't know about, or grandfather did. Um, or this family just swapped kids back and forth. Uh, so, so common. Absolutely. Well, so, have you done any writing about that? I've lost your name now. I'm sorry. Have you done any writing about that question? Uh, question? My name is Barbara. Uh, Thank you. No, I, I have not. And uh, can I just encourage you to, to begin? Yes. Um, yeah, you've got the kernel there. Everybody does, as I said. The kernel there of a great story and the, the the question the why is why the gap why the big gap between 1908 and 1922 true i mean i mean and you know what was happening in the world it could be all sorts of reasons for the gap but what was his reason whoa yes, yes. that's fascinating does anybody else want to share what they wrote or some uh brick wall that you've come across or if you brought a um a memento, we could turn on the video and see it. I have a memento, this is Monica. Oh, hello Monica, thanks for your participation. Yeah. Let's see. I oh, and Barbara, read. send me your email. Barbara, type your email into the box. Can you guys see me? I can yes. see you. Okay, because I know myself, I turned it off. Okay. I have this little book. Um, it is my grandfather's recollections of being in the military in World War I. And um, I've transcribed it, gotten that done, but I've gotten stuck with the whole um, illustrating it, um, trying to tie it into the actual places in France and Yep. Oh, there I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so I've, I've gotten kind of stuck. I do have pictures of him from the service. I did manage to find some of the original newspaper articles. Uh, he was much older than a lot of the uh, other recruits that, that uh, he ended up in the service with. Um, so his perspective is a little bit different. Um, but I, oh, what happened? <laughs> Sorry. I, I would like to, uh, I need to pick this back up. So yeah. um, I'm, I, I realize it's not necessarily my writing or my story, um, but it's his story that hasn't been shared with the rest of my family. And my intent for this little... Yeah. Um, 
diary is to donate it to the World War I Museum in Kansas City when I'm finished with it. Um, they've already told me that they would like to have it for the collection. So, Oh, fabulous. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of neat. But I would like to put the pictures and newspaper articles, et cetera, with it to, to make a book for the family. Yeah. So um, when you say you get stuck with that part, the pictures, you mean the actual production of a book? Um, can, no, actually, uh, and it's probably one of those things because I know too much. Um, I, I am a geographer by education and a map maker by, by education and trade. And I would like to have maps of France, but my grandfather's spelling of these French town names is probably more phonetic than correct. Of course. Yeah. So I'm, I've been kind of stuck there. And, yeah. Um, uh, yeah because I feel like a map is really an important part of uh, particularly the French side of things. The American side, the, the different places he was for training, et cetera. I've been doing well with that. Um, I've also been collecting uh, postcards from Etsy of the places that my grandfather was at in the United States, you know, the, the, um, oh, the training camps and that there were postcards. He's not necessarily in those pictures, but it's sure. illustrates where he was. So. Wow. It's, it's fascinating. Get back to that project. Absolutely. Hold okay. that, hold your book up again, right to the camera so we can all see it. Can and it, see is it, it's handwritten? Yes. Obviously, yeah. You didn't have it's all, let me see if I can find a page that yeah. is darker. Um, some of it's, a lot of it's in pencil. Yeah. But you can, oh, uh, that's can you see pretty. that? Um, all yeah. in all, his spelling and writing is wonderful. He was born in, um, in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire in a part of the world that will eventually become Poland again in 1889, and English was not his first language. So the fact that this was written in English as much as it was um, yeah. is, is marvelous. As a matter of fact, the whole thing is in English. It's not written in Polish at all. Wow. Uh, yep. So... Um, but, well, I agree that, you know, getting the place names is a good, you, you want to be accurate in something like that, but to also see the, his attempts is interesting. Yes. I and I planned on, on leaving the original, the, yeah. the original um, yes. and, and uh, you know, mark it somehow that I, you know, um, figured out what he was really trying to say there. Sure. So, what a treasure to have such a thing, and um, and that museum is going to love having it. I hope that you will consider turning your process into a presentation like this. I people, hadn't thought about that. People would absolutely be interested in your process, especially as it relates to we're 100 years out from that war, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You didn't ask for my opinion on that, but uh, no. I think it would be awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll Good luck to you. Okay, thank you. All right, Monica, for bringing a, a device, I mean, bringing something to show us, we will, I will send you my workbook for free. So put your email address in the chat. And you too, Barbara, who okay. shared before. All thank right. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to tell us about the brick walls you might have? I'd, and I'd love to hear about how you folks, what you folks do in your meetings, your genealogical meetings. Why are you there and how often do you meet and what happens? Sarah has something to share. Go for it. I, I won't turn on my, excuse me, I'm not going to turn on my camera because I don't know what you're going to see because I came in late. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair uh, enough. I, um, and I was, I've been <laughs> cooking food because, anyway, but I, I left the kitchen to do this. Okay. So I'll, um, one of our society, we have a writing group in my society. Yay. And one of our challenges is to write a letter to uh, an ancestor. So I've been working on this this week. It's not something I did right 
during your um, during your discussion, but I okay. I would share. So this is a great second great grandfather. Dear grandfather, I wanted to write a story about you, but I haven't discovered very much information about your early life. I have two third party sources, and while each gives a few pieces of information about your early life, they each tell a somewhat different story. In 1966, your grandson, Homer Harvey, wrote a story he called The Harvey Family, The John Harvey Family of Granola, Kansas. He begins with the story with this account, quote, in the early part of 1838, my father, John Harvey, was sent with a younger brother to live with an uncle in Ontario, Canada, as they had recently been orphaned in Lanarkshire, Scotland. While living in Canada, the adopted boys went through many hardships, and at the ages of 8 and 11, they took French leave and migrated to New York State. Here, the two boys became separated, and father lost permanent contact with his brother, Will. Here, too, father learned the Cooper trade, and it was not long before he was self-supported. So let me scroll down. So that's the end of, of, that's the, end of the quote, and the letter continues. Good okay. heavens, grandfather, the birth date on your tombstone in the Green Lawn Cemetery in Granola, Kansas, gives your birth date as the 7th of October, 1830. Doing a little math, you would have only been about eight years old when you sailed to Canada, and your brother was even younger. Did you and your brother sail by yourselves from Scotland, or did you travel with a relative? Did you sail from a port in Scotland or from a port in Great Britain? Where did you land in Canada? Did you have to travel far to your uncle's home? Was your uncle a brother of your father or a brother of your mother? What were the names of your mother and father? When you left your uncle's home when you were 11 and migrated to New York State, how did you travel? I've tried to imagine what that would have been like, two young boys traveling without any adults, walking through the forest alone, maybe listening for wild animals, hiding from other travelers for fear they'd return you to your uncle. Did you bring some food along? Was it a long journey? Or maybe your father's home was very close to the border and so entering the United States was fairly easy. I've tried to picture what society was like almost 200 years ago. Maybe there were lots of orphan children and no one gave it much thought to see young children fending for themselves, the older ones caring for the needs of the younger ones. Or maybe some of your uncle's neighbors saw how poorly your uncle was treating you and perhaps they were coming to the United States themselves and offered to take you and your brother with them. Or maybe you went to them and pled your case and begged them to take you with them. Oh, the stories the imagination can create in the absence of facts. That's, that's oh. the end. Oh, that, that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. You have, uh, you have already done uh, what I was trying to get you to do with the little assignment, to spin out. I, I basically, yeah, I had already yeah. written it this week, so I, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you spun out what I presume was somewhat spontaneously all the questions that came to your mind as you began to write to this ancestor right. of yours. And right. that was a great ex exercise that you landed. Whoever came up with that is... Uh, that was a great idea, right? Right to your ancestor. Right. Yeah. With all the questions, yeah. I have since found yeah. a book. Um, he was in the Civil War, and there's a book written about his unit, and he was a lieutenant, and there's a brief biography there, which says that in that little biography that he actually came to Canada in 1838 with his parents. So yeah. this account which was written 66 years after he died by his son who was 83 that says he was orphaned and came as an orphan and went on his own into New York State. That's kind of fantastical. Yeah, maybe a family myth. <laughs> so I, I need to reconcile what those two different stories yeah. are. Sounds like you have your work cut out for you, but a great yeah. story that needs telling. Yeah, just um, stick to yeah. it. This is my biggest challenge. That's my role. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we all understand that. We get it. Yeah, thanks for letting Thank me you. share. Yeah, put your um, email address in the chat box and I'll send you a link to my workbook. Thank you. I, yeah. I have a few things to share. Yeah, D, you're actually quite working. a lot. Uh, oh these, are, these are original handwritten letters between my great grandparents um, and also my great grandmother and one of her six sons. Um, they date back to um, 19, 
18 uh, when my grandfather was uh, a cab cabin steward for White Star Shipping out of Austin. Wow. And it's letters back and forth saying, how are their children? What are they doing? Um, and then I also happen to have um, the notification from the shipping company that my great grandfather got washed overboard um, somewhere between the coast of Florida and Cuba um, when he saved the life of the cabin boy. So, and I have saved an article. The he saved the life of the cabin boy. He saw a wave. The story goes that um, there was a wave cresting over the side of the ship, and the cabin boy was on his way to bring dinner to the captain. My great grandfather happened to see the height of the wave and pulled the cabin boy back more toward the middle of the um, deck. And the wave took my great grandfather instead of the cabin boy. And wow. I have a, um, a newspaper article about it. And I've got a small uh, death, I don't know if it's a death notice per se, uh, because I've never been able to find his death certificate either. Yeah. So, um, but, um, Dee, yeah. you've got a we got a big buzz on, yeah. on your microphone, and uh, we're gonna leave it at that. But that that sounds like the kernels of great story right there. Um, even if you can't get to the facts, turn it into something fictional. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna try and make it into uh, something of a little book or whatnot to give to the remaining Thomas family yeah. members. So. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, maybe beyond. How about that? Hopefully. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, put your email address in my in the chat box. I'll make sure to send you something. Um, and was there something you wanted to share now? Pam Miller out there? Let's see if I can find you. Yeah. There yeah. you go. There we go. I have an ancestor that um, served in the, he was a, would have been about a second great uncle, served in the Civil War. And um, when I first started doing research, about 2000, a uh, Civil War letter collector shared a letter that he'd written home in February 1862. So that kind of got me on the path of who was he and what was it all about. And um, uh, in 2013, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. and figure out some more of the story. He was POW twice. Um, he was shot in the arm at Gettysburg. So I have recently pulled together his story um, into a book. Oh, great. Yeah, and I didn't know. I thought I might read just the first page if you were interested. Yeah, give us one page. Yeah. 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 Um, the first chapter is called Answering the Call. Um, Jamestown, New York, eight, May 1861. Shape and Jay Lyon inhaled the crisp spring morning air as he stepped out the front door of his family home on Warren Street. Looking south towards Warren County, Pennsylvania, were the homes and farms of his Lyon and Shapen relatives. To the north was Jamestown and Fluvanna, where his Simmons cousins lived. Indeed, as he looked around, he was surrounded in every direction by a multitude of family and friends. As he trekked down the hill, Shape and Jay gazed at the trees leaping out and the multicolored flowers daring to come forth now that winter weather had chased away the deep winter snows. So at the bottom of the hill, the Shattacoin River drifted along with an early morning fog hanging over the surface. Shape and Jay crossed the bridge and headed uphill to the downtown office of James M. Brown, local attorney and military recruiter. So. That was oh. the, that's uh, it. Uh, that's the start of the book. Yeah, fabulous. And what caused you to finally put pen to paper? Um, believe it or not, um, a couple of years ago I had um, a scare with cancer, and I realized that if I didn't start putting some of this down, that it was going to be lost forever. So wow. um, it kind of pushed me. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, well, bless your heart, and, and we are all facing that deadline, aren't we? Yeah. So uh, get it out there, get it down, yeah. get it done, get it done, get it out there, get it down. I'm going to work on a 
theme song or something. I don't know. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Pam. That was fabulous, as Martha said in the chat box. Put your um, email address in the chat box so I can send you the workbook. Does anybody, I think we should wrap up in about five minutes here. Does anybody have questions about the writing process I did or the story or the brick walls I mentioned I'd come across? Any or historical questions, anything like that? Nothing. All right. Anybody have other things they want to share? Or um, open your mic and tell me about the group and what you do when you meet. The end notes to the story. Nadine, what do you mean by that? What about end notes? Do you mean uh, putting in where I got everything at, as sources? Is that what you mean, Nadine? Yeah. Uh, my book, because it's fiction, does not have such a thing. Um, I, I, I could recreate it if anybody asked where each and everything came from, but because I did turn it into fiction, I didn't feel compelled to have the sources cited. In future, I would probably do that. Um, Sherry, thank you. Uh, grateful for the pandemic. I'm in St. Louis and would not have been able to attend this. If, I'm, I'm interested in how you heard about it in St. Louis. That's awesome. This has been interesting and entertaining. Well, thank you. I'm so grateful to all of you and know that... Um, I intend to give Nicole a long list of links for all of you to uh, look at the book, uh, hear the first chapter. Um, yeah, tell the library how you heard about this webinar for all the way from California and um, Granite Bay, California. And wasn't there someone from Florida and further away? You've been a great audience, and I hope this worked well for you. The technology held in there, yay. Um, don't forget my Facebook group that I'd love to have you join, and then you can talk with others who are doing the same type of thing as you. Uh, West Virginia, missed it. Conference Keeper. Oh, Conference Keeper had it. That's a great site. Thank you. All right, I'm over, that, that, uh, over and out from me, and we'll turn this back to Nicole and see what she has to say. Hey everyone, just wanted to let you know that we do have a copy of Christine's book in the library. Um, I actually snuck it out of the library and I did not check it out, but you can place a hold on it and I will bring it back first thing tomorrow morning, I promise. Um, and I did just put some links about the feedback form. Um, if you'd like to fill that out and enter to win a library bag, that would be great. And also there's a link to our monthly newsletter if you'd like to sign up for that so you can see what other great programs we have going on. And Christine, I just wanted to thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I just wanna say that my family mystery, if you might wanna send me a, a workbook for the library collection, Oh yeah, um, oh, yes. <laughs> um, is uh, connected to the Cosa Nostra. So I am going to delve into that a little bit. So we'll see. <laughs> it's the Whoa, Italian mafia. Um, get, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, get on it. What, yeah. uh, when when you introduced yourself, you gave us a different uh, second name. What was that second name? Luongo. Luongo is that Luongo. Italian? It is. Yes. yes. So all four of my grandparents, Valeriani, Sorbello. Um, Giordano and Luongo. So, you know, I've got some connections all over Italy, all four areas. So yeah. it, it, it could be an interesting story. Well, <laughs> one of these, one of these days I'll have time to delve into it further. But. I have one word to say to you, the Sopranos. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I will send you the, the printed version of the workbook. The, the folks who won the prize today, they will get a PDF version that they can okay. download themselves. That would be great. Will... We'll add it to our special collections for reference. Okay. You will have a P thank uh, you. actual printed one. Anything else before we sign up? I would just like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you for making our virtual program successful, and we look forward to seeing you again. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you again, I hope. Maybe in person. <laughs> all right, I'm going to leave the meeting. <laughs>